Hello everyone, welcome to another wonderful Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Jen and today we're going to be talking all about the science of scuba. Do you feel like you're already underwater with these animals? I sure do and I don't even have any gear on. I guess that's kind of the benefit of doing things virtually, right? But there's nothing like getting in the water with these animals. So we're going to talk a little bit about you know, how, how we as humans are actually adapted to be able to be underwater, much like these animals right here. Now, I'm definitely not alone in the studio. I have Allie that's showcasing all of these wonderful pictures and videos behind me. And then I also have Carrie who's going to be taking in any questions or comments that you might have as well. And yes, you are allowed to participate and we actually encourage you to do so. So how, you may ask, right down below. Feel free to go on ahead and text us at 562 uh, 286-1838, and we'd be happy to take any questions or comments that you might have. Now, if you have maybe a more complicated question, or maybe you just want uh, a more in-depth explanation, you're always more than welcome to email us down below at live at lbaop.org. Now, let's go on ahead and get started and talk a little bit about the underwater world in general, because many human inventions are taken via inspiration from much of what we see around us in nature. So I'm going to go on ahead and step off the screen and we can look at our beautiful blue cavern habitats. This is a webcam that we have here, right here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Now this is mirrored after a habitat right in our backyard here in Long Beach, California. This is off of Catalina Island and this is to uh, basically copy one of a beautiful dive site known as Blue Cavern. And within this kelp forest habitat, you'll notice a variety of lovely animals residing within. Now, this is just to kind of gain inspiration to try to see, as you look at these animals, what adaptations, right? What features or characteristics do they have that help them to thrive in an aquatic or water environment? Hmm, what do you think some of those features might be? giant sea bass coming around for some inspiration and a shark. Ah, hopefully you feel inspired as I do. Now, if you want to go ahead and think about it, right? Fins! Fins are one of those special adaptations, right? We have feet that we use to be able to walk on land, but our animals here, instead of doing feet, it'd be kind of awkward to see a feet on fish, right? But they have these fins instead that help them to survive, that help them to move around, you know, either gracefully in a nice slow pace or maybe to really gain that speed that they need in order to, you know, head on off to catch a tasty meal, right? So definitely fins are one of those adaptations. What's another one? Hmm. If you're thinking gills, right, that's one of the more quintessential features of an underwater critter, right? They have gills that help them to breathe in water, much like how we have lungs that help us to breathe on land. And here we can see gill covering of our giant sea bass right there, where all the gills are located directly underneath. What might be another adaptation? Hmm. Something that you cannot see is actually they have something known as a swim bladder on the inside. And that swim bladder can either expand or deflate, or maybe it's full of oil, depending upon the animal. And it can help our fish either move up or down in what we like to call the water column, right? Where they are located in the top, middle, or bottom of our ocean or the habitat. Hmm. Can you think of any other special adaptations? Ooh, so Ricky's saying gills to breathe and fins to swim underwater. Absolutely, great might things, uh, great minds think alike, don't they? So, not only do they have that, they also have that swim bladder that we talked about. But something else that's inside is that they have, well, cold blood. They don't have to keep their blood warm, right? The water here off of Southern California is actually fairly chilly, right? And so with that they don't have to really expend the energy to be warm, right? You don't see any of these friends with like sweaters or anything like that to keep themselves extra toasty. So that would be kind of cute to see. But right, so these animals, they just have cold blood. So they are just cold blooded animals that can live in a, a cold 
water, right? Or maybe they live in tropical waters and they still have that cold blood, right? They don't generate their own body heat. Now, there are a few fish that are an exception to that that are considered warm-blooded, and they are amazing animals too. Uh, but for the most part, on average, most of these fish are going to be cold-blooded animals. Now, they also have scales to help protect themselves, right? As Ali went ahead and mentioned, against maybe against some rough surfaces or maybe, you know, against some potential predators that might come by. Those scales are like little mini shields on them to help protect their skin overall, right? But for the most part, those are the general features that are found in the animals. Now, we did get some questions that popped in. Rosalind's asking, have I ever gone scuba diving? I have. It is very fun. Though I must say, since the pandemic, I really haven't gone. So I literally feel like a fish out of water. Ha ha. Pun intended, right? And so I haven't gone, but I'm actually going to be snorkeling in about a month. And so I'm really excited to be able to hop into the water. Not the exact same as scuba diving, but at least you kind of get the underwater world um, and, you know, get a chance to check out and hang out with these fun animals. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. But yes, I have gone scuba diving in a handful of different locations around the world. So it's a very fun hobby to have um, if, if you can. Now, we also got another question of what are the best places to dive in California? You know, I haven't had a chance to dive up in Northern California, so I can't really speak to that. But there are a handful of areas where I learned was actually in, um, I live in Orange County, and so there's a handful of places in Laguna Beach that I have gone to uh, that are great spots. And then I've also dove in a few places down in San Diego too. Um, and then once or twice in Santa Cruz as well, so a little further up north. But there are a ton of different diving sites to be able to choose from. And depending upon your skill, right, um, there maybe some dive sites that are more suitable for you than others. But for inspiration, here you go. You can see some sea lions um, that, you know, who knows, may want to hang out with you as you are diving, right? But one of my favorite things, whether it be diving or even snorkeling, because snorkeling is a grand adventure too. Um, there are many reasons why you might not be able to actually go scuba diving, right? And so snorkeling is a fun way, or free diving even, is a fun way to be able to hang out and still be a part of the underwater world as well. But as we go on ahead, and our class is about the science of scuba, right? Let's go on ahead and think about those characteristics that help a fish or aquatic animal to thrive, right? Um, they have, they have a way to be able to breathe underwater, whether it be gills or in sea lions cases, lungs, right? They have that cold blood, so they don't have to worry about staying warm. They have a way to protect themselves through those scales, and they have those fins that help them to really kind of um, propel them through the water. Now, if we go on ahead, and I'm going to bring in my friend right on over here. I'm going to try not to be super clumsy about it. Ta -ta -da! Here we go. So, here we go. We have our scuba diver friend right here. And as we go on ahead and we look at our little scuba diver, or our big scuba diver, since it is much larger than me, right? There are some uh, pieces of technology that scuba divers, even snorkelers, or even free divers use that kind of help mimic some of those special adaptations that many of these animals have. So let's go on ahead and highlight and look at some of those features, right? Their eyeballs, first of all, not, not theirs, but the fish's eyeballs, right? They are also specially adapted to see underwater. Their lenses within their eye actually are, well, structured differently than we have on land. Look at that eyeball. Ah, beautiful. Now, if you looked within that eyeball, as I poke our Garibaldi, California state fish, in the eye right there, inside is a lens, and that lens helps focus a lot of the light and helps our fish able to see. Um, and so within that lens, right, they have to look through water as their medium um, to see, versus us, we look through air. So to kind of deal and combat with that change in medium that we are looking through with our eyes, goggles! are a great way to be able to, to have as a special adaptation. Ah, look at that crystal clear water already that we see, you know? And so these goggles are, allows us to kind of have a window into the underwater world, right? We're still looking through air, but then we have it through water as well. Now, if you're wondering, Jen, 
What if you have glasses like me, right? Now, I personally am terrible with contact lenses. I can't put them in at all. Um, so for me, what I can do and what many divers can do is there are prescription lenses. So you can actually pop out these different lenses right here and you can put in your own prescription lens. And as your prescription may change, like mine does, you can just switch out the lenses and voila, underwater goggle glasses. Pretty cool, huh? So. These, lo these goggles right here are great for that, and they have a seal that actually goes all the way around, so that way you are sealing those goggles to your, or that mask, right, to your face right there. Now, potentially, there may get water in there, but we divers actually have a special way to be able to clear that mask. Um, if there ever happens to be fog or water that gets in there, we can just go on ahead and lift, and then kind of blow bubbles, and it'll clear everything right out. Pretty cool stuff. Now, attached to the, this mask right here, we have our snorkel, right? Now, if you happen to be a snorkeler, these two keys, these two pieces are key, right, as part of your snorkeling gear. This snorkel, just, we have our, our mouthpiece right here, goes straight in, and then our snorkel um, basically is a big straw that has an opening at the top, um, and that opening really kind of allows, well, there's like a little lid on top, so it reduces the amount of water uh, that may come into the snorkel, so that way you're not sucking it on, on water, right? But it's a nice kind of tube that you're able to grab your air. Now, as you are diving, right, you are not necessarily using the snorkel underneath the water, but regardless of if you're beach diving or if you're boat diving, it's always kind of handy to have that snorkel because once you're in that water, you want to make sure that you're all set and that your dive buddy that's with you or the group that you're diving with is all set before you all descend on down. And so sometimes, you know, if there's waves coming by or, you know, that's not super um, calm, having that snorkel is really nice that way you're just not getting mouthfuls of water as you're sitting up right at the surface of the water itself waiting to descend for your dive. So snorkel, very important piece, right? But of course, if we think about it, we've had the eyes, but once we are no longer needing our snorkel, right, how exactly do we get down to the bottom and how do we breathe? Well, we have a regulator for that. And if I look on our friend Sherman here, he should have a regulator around. Aha, here we go. On the opposite side right here. Oops, that makes it tricky. I'm going to put it on over here on this side so we can see. Here is our regulator. And so just like the mouthpiece for our snorkel, we have one right here. And this just goes directly into the mouth right there. And that's how we're able to breathe. Now this regulator has a hose that's attached to our scuba tank that's located right back here. And so this is where all of our air is kept. Now, of course, it's important to know how much air that you have so that way you're not you know, sucking up all the air on your dive. And so usually there's a pressure gauge that will have a little sensor and tell you how much oxygen or how much air you still have. Because believe it or not, it's not pure oxygen that's in here. It's actually about 70 or so percent nitrogen, then the rest is oxygen, and then there's like 1% of other gases. Now, there can be different mixes of gases, so as you get more experience as a diver, um, you might want to get your nitrox certification or whatever else that you might want to do, and so, you know, the ratios might change from, from there in regards to, to how you dive and, and whatnot. Um, so there's lots of different levels of certifications that you can get as a diver. But definitely, the key pieces are pretty much the same, right? And so having this, this air tank right here is really great for us to be able to breathe and mimic kind of like those gills that you might find on an animal underneath the water right there. Now, of course, fish, like we mentioned, are cold-blooded, so they don't really have to worry so much about being warm. But of course, us being as warm-blooded animals, right, we kind of need to stay warm. So, um, you know, there are different thicknesses of wetsuits that you might use for that. So this is a fairly thin wetsuit right here, but you can get all sorts of different styles and thicknesses depending upon where you're choosing to, to dive or to snorkel. And they also come in different fun colors too, and then also different styles, right? So this is just one style. There's another one where you could be more like a Farmer John style wetsuit where you like come in almost like overalls and you wear like a coat over top and you zip it up and there's like shorty ones where they're almost like shorts and they're almost like tank top style. There are so many different varieties depending upon what conditions, right? And there's also 
dry suits here too. So here we have um, one of our volunteers, Paul, showcasing his dive suit. So if you're in really cold waters, right, the last thing you want is actually to have this wetsuit with a wetsuit. You are wet when you are inside and you are actually, the way you stay warm is you are basically warming the water that's entrapped in between your wetsuit and your or the and your body, right? So that's how you're able to stay warm. Kind of like how when you put on a coat, right? You might stay warm, you're warming that air in between. That's how it works for a wetsuit, that water in between. Now, when you are in super cold water, having a wetsuit doesn't quite help. So instead, you have to have a dry suit. So that's what we have right here. You stay completely dry, or for the most part, dry in this dry suit right here. Um, and so that way, you are just kind of warming whatever air is inside. And it's a much more effective way of, of staying warm, right? So there's all sorts of different kinds of wetsuits. Now, Yasmin is asking, when, um, when have I gone snorkeling and what's the favorite animal that you've seen of close? I go snorkeling, well, I used to go more snorkeling more often than I used to, um, and I've lived in a variety of locations, some warm water, others colder water, and my last handful of years, because I do move a lot, um, was actually in really super cold water, so I haven't gone snorkeling all that often up there. But since moving um, back down here, I've had a chance to go snorkeling a handful of times. And like I said, due to the pandemic, I really haven't gone into the water much as I've just kind of stayed inside of my own home. So it's at least been a year since I've gone snorkeling. Too long. But next month, I'm really excited um, to be going snorkeling. And I actually live fairly close to a lot of snorkel and dive sites. I live about like 15 minutes away from the beach. And so that's probably where I'm gonna go snorkeling. And I'm really excited but I also need to get new lenses. So I'll be doing that shortly too, right? Because my prescription has changed since the last time I snorkeled. But yeah, I like to go um, whenever I can. The tricky part though is visibility. So sometimes you can dive a little bit more uh, seasonal because during the winter time, right, it's, we have storms that are coming in and um, there are a lot of ocean processes that are happening where we have a lot of cold water that's moving down from underneath and it's coming up to the surface during the early springtime. And so we have a lot of plankton blooms and those plankton basically kind of create our, uh, our water off of our coast to be kind of murky. And that's part of the reason why we have such rich environment within our ocean is because because of those plankton. And so sometimes during the springtime, it's not super great during early spring. Winter, it can be, you know, really hit or miss and it's really cold then too. Um, it really just kind of depends on, on your location, but definitely like, you know, um, late spring, summertime, um, early fall, are, are kind of nice times, at least within Southern California, to be able to go. Now, every single place has its own dynamics, right? So like if you are an area that has lots of bays, maybe there's certain calmer times where the water, you might get better visibility than others. So it just kind of disip um, just kind of depends on, on where you're at and what the seasons are and how your water just kind of within your area moves and circulates too, depending upon the season. So that is a good question. Now. Favorite animal that I've seen up close? I would have to say, it's not any, well, I think it's really exciting. It would be a salp. Now, I, everyone's laughing in the office because it's like, you know, maybe like, you know, a cool whale shark or maybe like a sea turtle or maybe a shark. And I guess I have seen sea turtles and sharks and they are incredible. But there's something special to me about an animal that basically, well, it's clear, it doesn't look like much, and it's about this big. So if you imagine, I don't know, maybe like a, a hot dog that's kind of clear, that's going in the water, um, and there's a whole bunch of them that are linked up together in a circle, uh, that's pretty much what a colony or group of salps look like. And to me, that was really thrilling to see. These animals, which I don't think we have any pictures of, because there's not, they're not a common one that we ever talk about, because, well, they're not... They are common, but they're, they're more offshore. And so because of that, I think they're really unique animals. Um, related to them are tunicates. Basically, they're really simple animals that filter water one way, and then the water goes out the other way. They're, they're hollow, they're clear, not super exciting, but I have a great appreciation uh, for salps. I really enjoy them. And so to me, that was an exciting thing. But I have seen other animals, like I said. Um, I've seen a lot of sharks down in San Diego. 
actually go snorkeling for that one. So that's really fun to be able to see. Um, and then also um, lobsters I've seen, which is really fun. I've yet to see an octopus, believe it or not. Um, but I've seen a handful of sea turtles, corals, um, you know, a lot of different kinds of crabs, sand dollars, all sorts of different animals, which is really fun. And I think that's one of the fun things, right, is that you can just dunk your head underneath the water, regardless if you can snorkel or scuba, and you get to be part of this really cool underwater world, right? Because if you think about it, everything that we see, when we think about, like, the media or anything like that, or we see pictures of the ocean, it's just the top, right? We only get a chance to see, like, oh, yes, that big, beautiful blue ocean, but then when you look underneath, right, we might get corals like this or kelp forests that we saw earlier. It's completely different and pretty magical. So you never know what you're going to see in all different parts of the world. Now, Ms. Amador is asking, when you scuba dive, do sea animals swim away and hide from the divers? That is a good question. Now, it kind of depends on the area. And... <clears throat> Excuse me, I get so excited here. Uh, it kind of depends on the area, um, how frequently divers kind of hang out in that area, and the types of types and amounts of animals that you might see. So, like for instance, when I go diving or snorkeling, sometimes I may be enveloped in a small school of within our area top smelt. Right, they're little silvery fish um, that kind of hang out towards the top, and so you know they may be kind of swimming away from me, but I'm also kind of swimming with them because they're not super far away. So, um, but then you. You have like all these rockfish, right? And these rockfish, they just kind of hang out. They stay where they, they are. They don't do a whole lot. Their goal is to just kind of blend in with the background behind them. So, and if you think about, you know, like lobsters, they just might kind of hang out in their crack or crevice and not really care. Uh, many worms, I've seen a lot of worms, uh, they just kind of hang out too. Fortunately, they don't run that quickly, so they're really easy to kind of see and check out. Also another fan favorite, right? So there's, it depends on the animal, but you know, other larger ones may. Um, some of the sharks I've snorkeled with, they don't even care that I'm there. They're just doing their own thing and it doesn't matter. So kind of depends on the animal but great question now Braden's asking is it safe to touch the sea animals when diving or is it just best to look and not touch that is a great question I would recommend look but not touch right um kind of taking a picture with your eyes but not you know leaving an imprint um, where your surroundings are right so here we have a great example and I think we might be able to say I don't know if my scuba diver friends in the way but there are scuba divers in the background. Ha ha, there you go. You can see one back there, right? And so these divers are looking, but they are not touching. Uh, turtles are considered endangered, so you're actually not supposed to touch them. There are certain animals that, you know, have certain rules. Uh, but also different animals have different adaptations, right? So for instance, some rockfish might have venomous spines, so you definitely don't want to touch those. And it's just best overall to, to be able to look and not touch, right? And so that same thing goes for all of your equipment too, right? So if you're in a coral reef or anything like that you want to make sure that your fins don't touch or drag onto the coral or that sea floor right we want to make sure that we are actually floating directly above so if you remember how we were talking about the swim bladder of these animals right these swim bladders help our fish to move up and down that water column now within our gear we actually have something that's a little vest that we have right here and this is called our bcd and that's our buoyancy compensation device and so with this device that we have right here this is kind of like our version of our swim bladder we can use the the tank right here and we can pump air into here so we can blow it up so it could you know like when we're at the surface, we want to blow up so that way we're just kind of floating up top. But when we're diving down, um, we want to make sure that the air is completely out of this because we want to make sure that we are as close to what we like to call neutrally buoyant as possible. So if we think about, you know, putting anything in water, whatever we put in water, we displace that much volume, right? Like we put something in, like if you're in a bathtub, right? For instance, you the bath water is at one level, you hop in and that bathtub water level rises, right? That's because we are now in that bathtub. We are displacing the water because of the extra volume that we have. That's us inside of that water. And any kind of 
Now, a bathtub wouldn't work, but when we're in the ocean, there is actually a force that's pressing on us upwards. And so that is the buoyancy. And if we are neutrally buoyant, which means that we are pretty much in the middle, we're not going to be floating. We're not going to be sinking. We're going to be somewhere right in the middle. If we're positively buoyant, we're going to be up at the very top. And if we're negatively buoyant, we're going to be all the way down at the bottom. And so we want to be somewhere in between. That neutral buoyancy that we have, see some divers right here, right? Actually move Sherman out of the way real quick. There we go, right? As you get a chance to see these happy-go-lucky divers, one of them is actually part of our staff, Dina. Um, you know, they are neutrally buoyant. They are kind of in between, right? They're not down below. They are not up at the surface. They are in between. Now, there are a lot of different parts to kind of getting that neutrally buoyant space within the water. Tricky part is we ourselves are neutrally buoyant. Our bodies are naturally neutri neutrally buoyant. But the gear that we have on us kind of plays tricks with our buoyancy. Our wetsuit that we have on us, that makes us positively buoyant. It's, it's kind of spongy, it's kind of foamy, so we kind of naturally float up at the top, right? Um, but then um, our tank may also help play parts of that too. So we may start out as positively buoyant because of all the gas that we have in our tank. And then as we breathe over time, maybe our tank might become neutrally buoyant, may lose a lot of that oxygen, and then the metal that it is, right, might weigh us down. So it's kind of really tricky to be in that middle. Our lungs, too, also play a part in this whole buoyancy game, right? So parts of the ways in which you can control your buoyancy is how much air that you have within your BCD, right, that vest right there, um, and then how you breathe, too. For me, I sometimes have trouble with my buoyancy because I get really excited to see something like that worm or that south and then I breathe really hard because I get super excited and I start going up some and then I have to calm myself down to bring myself back a little bit lower. But you also have a weight, uh, you have weights on you too. You can either have weights, a weight belt. If you imagine like Batman and how he has a belt across, right? And imagine with pockets of weights, that's kind of what a weight belt looks like. I don't think there's one on Sherman right here or Sherwood right here, but you can also have an integrated weight BCD. So where you can actually put weights inside of your little buoyancy vest. And that might be another way too. Just depends on what you end up preferring. So um, those are some different ways that you can kind of play with your buoyancy and help control your buoyancy when you are diving like we have here. Now, Aiden is asking, are whale sharks dangerous or are they safer than other species of shark? Ah, that is a very interesting question, right? Whale sharks are called whale sharks because they are super huge. Now, believe it or not, my, uh, my in-laws are really big divers and they have dove with a variety of sharks, whether they be hammerheads or whale sharks or any kind of other shark in between. They have seen a lot of different sharks and they've done so in a very safe manner, right? So all sharks, just like all animals, right, all have different kinds of behaviors um, and they all kind of react to different environments and different people differently. So it really kind of depends, but as long as you're with a group um, in an organization or a company that does things safely, then you should be totally fine to be able to dive with a variety of these animals. Um, but yeah, it really kind of it really kind of depends on the animals. But you know, many of them, like I said, when I snorkel with sharks, they don't even care that I'm there. They're just doing their whole thing, having a good time, right? But scientists are actually able to study many of these sharks in a variety of ways. And one of the ways they can do that is by diving. Um, but there are lots of other ways too. Like as Miss Amador's class was asking earlier are animals um, affected by us right in our presence so let's just say you are studying sharks or you're studying the types of sharks right our presence or you know maybe like our our time being now our safety not in regards maybe in regards to animals but more so in regards to us being down for a long time there's a lot of pressure and a lot of gases that can enter our blood and so we as divers need to be careful on how often we dive and at what depths um, and we also as humans only have a limited time of being down there right maybe 45 minutes or so or thereabouts um, depending upon how heavily you breathe and so and we also might need to use the restroom or 
or we might get hungry. So if you ever want to be able to study animals like these beautiful sharks for a prolonged period of time, something that you can do is kind of set up a study area that we have right here, right? Maybe you want to study the environment that they're in. Now these scientists or these divers are actually doing a transect right here meaning that they are kind of measuring out different areas and counting the, the things that are living within those areas. Um, and so you may want to take a sample of your area, but and then kind of figure out from there um, what kind of animals might live there. But if you're looking at bigger animals like sharks, you may just want to set up a camera. And so there is um, there is a study out there called Global Fin Print that really focuses on setting up a camera underneath the water more in tropical waters as you can have much better visibility there, much like what you would see here. And they set up these cameras to then video what's kind of going on under the water. And they actually have little baited sticks out that are filled with fish and other tasty treats where they are luring the sharks in the nearby area. And so that way you're able to see many of the types of animals that live there that aren't affected by scuba divers or humans being the area. And you can get a much better idea of the kinds of sharks and other critters, and also how they interact with one another um, by having that baited camera right there. All right, friends, now we just touched the surface of exploring down in the ocean, right? But I'm really excited and glad that we were able to talk a little bit about being a scuba diver, right? Um, but also kind of that same gear also kind of goes for snorkeling. So if scuba diving isn't your thing, or you know maybe you just can't go to that depth, not to worry, right? There's many other ways that you too can explore, which uses much of the same equipment, minus the, the tank as well as maybe that, that BCD, right? But you would still be able to use that wetsuit and the snorkel and the mask and much of the other gear too. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. If you do have any further questions, we'd love to hear from you. Go on ahead and send an email down below at live at lbaop.org. And uh, hopefully I inspired you to go under the water and check out our underwater world. I'm definitely excited to do that soon. And I hope you all get a chance to at some point as well. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.